So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining Mon our Monty Hart CAT conference. Um, we are really honored today to have a good friend, Peter Schneider, who really is a world leader in peripheral intervention and the vascular interventions. And Peter has taken an hour out of his day to, to join us to talk about innovative tools on the horizon for the treatment um, of peripheral vascular disease. Peter, one of my partners is also on ASMA, who will be doing a lot of the discussion. ASMA is the director of our endovascular program here and someone I was looking forward for you to meeting and hopefully we can find many ways to collaborate in the future with ASMA. ASMA, are you on? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Azim. Um, hi, Dr. Schneider. Uh, very nice mm -hmm. to meet you. It's it's my honor and pleasure to co-host with um, Dr. Thief. Great. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So Peter, without further ado, please, uh, it's all yours. Thank you for thank you for doing this again. Yeah, th thanks for the invite. Yeah, so um, I thought um, it it would be uh, good to talk about uh, uh, CLTI, and part of CLTI is that uh, you know sometimes it feels like we're standing still a little bit because we still have a high risk of limb loss, et cetera, with CLTI, but. Um, there are a lot of new tools that have either recently been employed or or are about to be. And so I just wanted to go over those today. So these are my disclosures. I do a lot of consulting for a variety of, of different companies, some of which have devices in that space. So what's changed over the last five years? Well, um, there's definitely been growth, sophistication, and increased awareness of CLTI. Uh, we do have reporting standards in the sense that we have some specific guidelines and we also have things like the global vascular guidelines as well as um, a variety of new tools such as a wi-fi uh, criteria for for assessment or categorization of patients we also have the um, the glass classification for uh, categorization of lower extremity occlusive disease, which almost always in CLTI, it's a multi-level uh, type of disease. Um, we've identified the value of teams and the importance of wound management, something that seems at this point intuitive, but the truth is in, until we incorporate that, it's um, hard to really understand the value, but I think increasingly that's been added. And we also have some new and specific devices, wires, sheaths, balloons, CTO catheters, et cetera, some of which were adapted from the coronaries, but more and more now we're having devices that are specifically designed for the type of disease and um, the distances and the uh, types of procedures that we're doing with, you know, long lesions, et cetera, in the, in the, especially in the below the knee space. We, we've got some modified balloons, uh, we've got atherectomy tax, and at some point we'll have drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents, and I'll, I'll go over that. We've also got some new techniques uh, for crossing CTOs, especially in the BTK space, and increasingly pedal access now, I think, has been adopted in most sophisticated programs that, that really enhances the CTO device, uh, CTO type lesions that we can deal with. We also have lots of new clinical trials. Now, I'm not gonna go over a lot of them, but but there are a lot of trials, some of which have been negative, unfortunately. Uh, so for example, the recently the Saval trial, which was a paclitaxel coated self-expanding nitinol stent for the BTK space uh, that failed to uh, reach its endpoint and was not superior to balloon angioplasty. And then others that you know, again, I'm not going to take a deep dive on these. It would be a whole separate subject. But uh, recently, the best CLI trial was uh, published in New England Journal three weeks ago, and I, I was fairly involved in that. And and that one is uh, important because it shows that bypass still plays a role. Uh, we can discuss that in the discussion segment if you like, um, although that wasn't specifically what I was going to uh, go over today. Nevertheless, the field has really changed. I uh, hope, hope that makes it clear. And these things also have tr tremendously changed our field and have changed coronary work as well. And I'm sure you're seeing these things in the coronary space. So dramatic increase in the number of Americans with diabetes, dramatic increase 
in the prevalence of ESRD, uh, but at the same time, fewer smokers. Um, lowest smoking rates now as ever recorded. And so what does this mean? Well, it's nice that people are quitting smoking, but it also means that the disease is moving distally. So we have more calcification, more tissue loss, and more occlusive disease in the tibial arteries, and unfortunately also the pedal arteries. And I'm sure in the coronaries, this manifests as the inability to identify uh, targets and more patients who are non-revascularizable. The other thing is that uh, this is the Swede pad study. This is again one of those uh, major studies that I mentioned that's come out in the past five years. The, this is just an example that I that I brought to um, show the difference in mortality. On the left is the mortality in patients with intermittent claudication. So that's typically people with iliac and SFA disease. Sometimes diabetic, sometimes not. And on the right is in the CLTI population. So patients presenting either with rest pain or tissue loss. And the point here was to compare paclitaxel and non-paclitaxel coded devices. And in this case, with respect to mortality, and you can see the mortality is, is a disaster in that right-hand uh, graph of CLTI patients with at, at four years, almost 50% of the patients are dead uh, with CLTI. And I think this recent paclitaxel controversy that the vascular field has gone through uh, has really reminded us and focused a spotlight on this mortality issue, which, um, which is uh, a major burden for our patients. So what about new actual specific devices? Well, you know, one of the challenges we've always had in the in the space in the reva in the lower extremity revascularization space is the fact that you know we don't have a good way to assess tissue perfusion on a moment by moment basis, and this has, this remains an unmet need. But the point of this slide is to show that there are numerous companies, numerous startups that are working on this at the present time that are uh, using a variety of things like laser Doppler or hyperspectral imaging. Uh, one of the companies, Profusa, that I've done quite a bit of work for, and right now we're doing a pivotal trial at uh, UCSF um, using an implantable oxygen sensor. So it's a, it's a micro sensor in a, in a uh, biodegradable hydrogel that can be injected around a wound in the foot or anywhere else. And, and the auction can be measured at any time. And eventually that'll be remote. So the patient will be able to wave an iPhone or, or similar device over the sensor and identify the auction level. And you can see uh, this is a, this um, uh, view down here on the lower right is the use of one of these intra procedurally. So as you're deciding how many levels of disease do I need to open, how many tibials do I need to open? Do I need to go into the foot and into the pedal loop? The oxygen sensor is responding, but all of these require validation, quantification, and clinical correlation so that we can understand their, their value. Here's just another, this is a tool that I've gotten to use and this one's out there. There's a company called eCare out of Virginia. And what this is, is the application of the use of high definition uh, photography with, um, artificial intelligence. So when in the way I use this device was as part of a clinical trial. So this is now monitoring wounds using photographs. And when you take a photograph, it gives you the, um, the area and the depth that compares it to all the previous photographs of that same patient's wound. But it also compares it to thousands and thousands of others in terms of uh, understanding its rate, its potential etiology, et cetera. So this is something that, uh, you know, we've dealt with CLTI and we've typically thought about wound healing as improving or getting worse or totally healed, but this is all very, you know, uh, very wishy-washy compared to what you can do with this particular device. Um, the other thing is, you know, in the, in the peripheral artery space, um, the, at this point, still the most common method of achieving a lumen 
an arterial lumen using endovascular means is with balloon angioplasty. And yet we've known for since its inception that balloon angioplasty has some disadvantages. It doesn't function by plaque compression. Of course, we know that it uh, functions by uh, stretching, by rupture of the of the artery down to the adventitial layer, typically with stretching of the external elastic lamina. And this results in dissection. And dissection is the mechanism of balloon angioplasty. And we should never be surprised when we actually can demonstrate those angiographically. So, and these are just, um, this slide represents different ways in which below the knee angioplasty, which remains one of the cornerstone therapies for in the BTK space, but uh, below the knee angioplasty has failures. And so on the upper left hand, you see these are different um, trials, Biolux, P2, Lutonix, Impact Deep. They're all drug-coated balloon trials. But look at the final residual stenosis. And this is in a carefully designed trial where balloon angioplasty protocols were used. And you can see that the residual stenosis is anywhere from 26 to 30%. Um, on the upper right hand, what you see is a trial done by um, um, done done by Andre Schmidt out of Leipzig, probably you know one of the top interventionists in the world, and certainly the top live case operator. And he did a consecutive series of tibial angioplasty, seventy-seven patients with a mean lesion length of eighteen centimeters. So these are like the kind of norm. These are the kind of lesions we deal with all the time. They're not cherry picked, almost two thirds were occlusions, but then he did something we don't typically do, or is not so easy to do in the US. He did an obligatory three month angiographic follow up. And what he found was that 38% um, were reoccluded and 31% had a hemodynamically significant recurrence stenosis. So almost 70% essentially had failed at three months. So pretty clearly we have to do better than that. And here are some of the uh, dissection rates in different trials. And by that, what I mean is that these are dissections that were easily identifiable by angiography and were thought to be hemodynamically significant. And here are just some examples of what that looks like. And so this, um, this uh, I, I, I would say uh, it's not a fatal flaw, but it's a, it's a disadvantage of angioplasty that we have to work with, work around, and uh, eventually we'll, we may have other tools that replace that. So, but, uh, you know, this gives us pause and it also gives us reasons to go back and look at what we're doing. And there are ways to uh, optimize angioplasty. And this is a, a project I worked on with several uh, colleagues where we, we went through all the steps of angioplasty and came with a specific algorithm for how to get the best results. And that's not important for today, but the key thing is these are just really tremendously different than the lesions of the coronary space. They might be in similar sized arteries, but typically uh, e even the lesion that you're treating is not alone, that the artery juxtaposed to it, proximal and distal to it, is not normal. They're typically high resistance runoff beds <clears throat> and, and lots of reasons for that artery to go down. So another uh, thing to consider is, you know, can we get even more out of our angioplasty balloon? And this is a device called the uh, serenator. And it, what it is is serration angioplasty. So it's a creating a, um, a plane or a kind of a dot, 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 a cut along the dotted line type um, markings inside the artery on several different planes um, so that when the artery is expanded by balloon after there's these little holes have been poked in it that the artery can expand along that line the same way if you tear a check out of a checkbook if anybody has checkbooks anymore um, or or you you open a fedex envelope you have a um, a serration where you can uh, where your energy can be directed so that it won't um, so that it won't tear willy-nilly and this is just some examples of you can see the, uh, what serration angioplasty do, does. And there are other modified balloons with different types of wires and cutters on the outside. And with those, you can get up to 20 plus times the uh, outward force that you get of a balloon. But with point force or the serration 
concept you can get a thousand times. Kind of like the difference between somebody stepping on your foot with uh, KEDS versus stepping on your foot with stilettos. Um, and here's just an example of a serration angioplasty case uh, a, uh, uh, with three vessel occlusion and then uh, treatment of the AT and the perineal. This is a kind of a case where the perineal, uh, uh, one, one of these anatomic anomalies where the perineal becomes the posterior tib down in the foot. And you can see the three month follow up with the toe pressure dramatically increased. Um, and this is the, these are some of the results of serration angioplasty with um, a, better, uh, a better final residual stenosis, more like 21-22% instead of 30% with a uh, less need for stents and with uh, better freedom from CDTLR. Uh, shockwave, uh, intravascular lithotripsy, I'm sure you're using that in the coronaries. There's gathering data. Um, one, you know, one challenge in the BTK space is that the balloon's a little bit bulky and it's a little bit short. You know, each of those electrodes needs to be wired. So we're limited on length, whereas, you know, very often in the BTK space, we're using balloons up to 20 centimeters or, uh, or so. Um, I don't know that it would ever be possible to create a really long balloon using IVL. Nevertheless, if you have a heavily calcified lesion, um, this may be useful. I find this actually to be a little bit more helpful in the FEMPOP segment where you very often get, instead of medial calcification like you have in the BTK, you get this uh, enamel and mixed calcification with large um, eccentric uh, boulder type lesions in the FEMPOP segment. Um, and that's typically where, where I've used it more. But nevertheless, there's more data, more than 1,800 patients enrolled in various programs clinically, and you can see several of them include uh, BTK patients. So, um, and that's not typically considered standalone therapy, but in terms of creating a, a lumen, um, that's particularly helpful. Um, then there's also the TAC endovascular system. So, the TAC device actually was my idea, uh, started at my kitchen table. I figured, you know, why are we putting these full metal jackets into these diffuse lesions? It doesn't make any sense. So uh, this is a project I worked on over years. So in that sense, I'm conflicted, um, uh, but it no longer belongs to me. Now it's uh, a product of Philips. Uh, but this concept, I think, of focal dissection repair, it's, it's a different kind of concept. Um, with, uh, with drug, we need drug everywhere we're touching, but in the periphery, it's not really practical at this point. So, uh, and here's just an example. This is from Marianne Broadman out of uh, Graz, Austria, and she was one of our PIs. You can see these dissections. These are, this is a core lab adjudicated study. They graded these as type C dissections. This is what it looks like after focal dissection repair with two tacks in the upper one and one tack in the lower. And the, and the idea is that, uh, that we know we're gonna cause and create dissections and to leave uh, flow limiting uh, situations and tissue hanging in the lumen in these long diffuse, uh, diffusely diseased, slow flow, small caliber arteries, it doesn't make sense. So, and you can see the, um, this is our pivotal trial in the US and at, at one year, the patency, target lesion patency was 78.6 and the tact segment patency was 81%. And the uh, lesions were uh, 15 centimeters plus or minus 11 centimeters. So real lesions that we typically would deal with. And you can see what the map looks like of the places where they were uh, inserted. So including the middle and lower parts of the leg where uh, off-label drug eluting coronary stents don't typically um, work. And, and we're worried about the, the crushing uh, of the stents by external forces, whereas this is a self-expanding device. So um, uh, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that this is the only now FDA cleared uh, device in the BTK space. Uh, and, you know, eventually we'll have uh, bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds or drug eluting stents, etc. But right now what we have, the only thing we have that's on label is focal dissection repair. So what about um, what about drug delivery? Well, obviously it's revolutionized the coronary space, um, 
but it remains problematic in the BTK space. Um, and in the uh, and so this is just looking at drug coated balloons and drug eluting stents in both the FEMPOP segment and the BTK segment. So if we look at the FEMPOP segment, it's not really the the focus of of today's talk, but it's great to uh, compare and contrast. So we have several uh, paclitaxel based drug coated balloons that are improved. Um, we um, we have Limus uh, balloons, you know, various analogs of Sirolimus in development. Uh, one of them is particularly far along. It's called Met Alliance. It was recently acquired by um, Cordis in a in a what looked like about a seven or eight hundred million dollar deal, but it's all back loaded. So in other words, it looked like um, they still have to prove that it works before Cordis is going to fully take over the company. Nevertheless, um, several paclitaxel based uh, DCBs uh, with regards to drug eluting stents, we have two paclitaxel based drug eluting stents approved Zilver and Eluvia, one from uh, Cook, one from Boston, uh, and bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds are in development. We've had three Limus based stent trials in the FEMPOP segment that have failed over the years, Sirocco, Strides, and Stroll. The most recent one was in the late zero, so it's been a long time. It's been over a dozen years since we've had an effort to create a lemus based uh, drug eluting stent for the FEMPOP segment. In the BTK space, uh, we have um, uh, several paclitaxel drug coated balloon failures. So the lower left hand box, we've got uh, Lutonix, Impact, and Biolux all failed. Uh, a couple of others that were in development, one from uh, one from Phillips and one from Boston, Stellar X and Ranger were stopped. We have, um, uh, so so it's so interesting that Pactaxel coated balloons in the FEMPOP segment have been a rousing success, essentially. Every single trial has been a success. In the BTK space, we've had several, we've had three clear cut failures and two that got scared or at least felt like they wouldn't meet their endpoint and stop their trials. Uh, we've got two more, one from a Chinese company, Ecotech, uh, which is uh, has had, I'll show you that, it's a small randomized trial and they're gonna apparently go forward with their pivotal and impact, which is uh, also got a small randomized trial. That one's a reformulated effort from Medtronic. And then we have several Lemus uh, devices in development, MetAlliance, again, the one I mentioned before, Concept Medical is a startup out of India, and Sermotics, a US-based company that has a, a drug-coated balloon below the knee called Sundance. It's also Sirolimus. And with respect to BTK drug eluding stents, uh, I mentioned already the Saval trial. This is a paclitaxel coated self-expanded stent that had a failed trial. We have the PADI trial, which is several years old. It was a drug eluding stent below the knee using paclitaxel. That, that was, a, I would say, a moderate success, but not strong enough to do a trial in the US. Um, and then we have various, you know, uh, off-label uh, balloon expandable coronary stents being used and bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds. So you can see that depending on whether it's a balloon or a stent or it's above the knee or below the knee, there's a dramatic difference in the kind of the outcome and the development and the, what the trial results have been, et cetera. Um, and uh, th these are just one year patencies for drug eluding stents below the knee. Again, they're all off label. One of the things you really notice is it's high patency. Every trial showed 70 to 87% patency, but also very short lesions. So, so 16 millimeters up to 47 millimeters. So, you know, we, man, we just don't manage that many really short lesions below the knee, but when they were put into a trial, they did, I would say pretty well. Um, and again, the, so one of the challenges is the, the crushable nature of the balloon expandable stents in that exposed area. So what's this? Well, this is just looking at BTK interventions, and these are a variety of trials using either drug eluting stents or drug coated balloons, almost all of them from outside the US. Um, but just looking at the lesion length, so the drug eluting stent studies on the left, you can see what the lesion lengths look like. 
and the drug-coated balloon studies on the right, the lesion lengths, of course, are much longer. And so this really creates a bit of a dilemma because mostly we deal with these long lesions and, um, and we don't have any drug-coated balloon approved. But just in terms of the different paradigms, they're completely different. The concept of treating a focal versus treating a, a long lesion. And these lesions are typically either in parallel or even more likely in series. That is, maybe in the same artery, a short one in one place and a long one in another. So creates a little bit of a dilemma. So these are the paclitaxel drug coated balloon studies. So the three on the left, the Impact Deep, Biolux P2 and Lutonix BTK were all failures. None of them led to a labeled product in the US. But on the right hand side, what you see is Medtronic has a, a drug coated balloon with Papatax over below the knee. They did a 50 patient randomized trial and they, the subsegmental late lumen loss was significantly improved using classical late lumen loss though it wasn't significantly different and i apologize for a little bit of the um, shifting of the of the slide there but um i think i'm <laughs> i'm going to go to a medtronic sab uh, meeting later this week and they're in the midst of deciding whether they're going to go forward with this device in the u.s um Ecotech, that's a chinese company a uh, company out of china i mentioned this is the eco art to BTK study, 120 patients. It's a randomized trial outside the US. Target lesion, 17 centimeters, so real lesions. Uh, primary patency at six months was dramatically better for DCB than for PTA. And they're thinking about right now whether they're gonna go forward with a pivotal trial in the US. There's been a big hubbub about uh, the, the uh, mortality risk of Papataxel. Um, I'm part of a consortium that's leading uh, that's leading a individual uh, patient level meta meta analysis update uh, uh, in corroboration with the FDA to kind of conclude this issue. And from what I can see, and again, not revealing anything confidential, just looking at the data that's out there right now, it looks like the Paclitaxel uh, scare was just that. It was a scare. It's not real. Um, and that's a really a subject of a whole different story, but it really caused everyone to pause and say, hey, wait a minute, we're giving these dangerous drugs to these uh, already critically ill patients. Are, are we really okay with that? So this is a just a study to follow up on that, but specifically this is in patients who have CLTI. So these are patients who had BTK paclitaxel treatment, almost 15,000 of them with five-year follow-up. The Barmer Insurance is it's an insurance product in Germany that covers around 19, 20% of the population there. So they use propensity match pairs and, and actually found slightly better uh, survival in the paclitaxel group, uh, as well as no difference in mortality, cardiovascular events, amputation or death in those who received paclitaxel. And then one other, this is the safe PAD. These are Medicare patients, 160,000. Medicare patients, no increase in the risk of amputation versus uh, paclitaxel versus non-paclitaxel. And this is the Voyager randomized trial, um, also which came out last year, uh, showing no difference in major adverse limb events between paclitaxel, no paclitaxel. So, um, and these are some of the sirolimus uh, uh, drug coated balloons for BTK use that are being developed. So this is the solution I already mentioned that Cordis now has gotten involved with this company. And this is done by creating micro reservoirs out of biodegradable polymer. And this is the challenge is that lemus is not so easily absorbed into the arterial wall. Uh, paclitaxel, which is hydrophilic, it, uh, it absorbs very rapidly into the arterial wall, but Sirolimus does not. And of course, in the in the setting of a drug eluting stent, you have a polymer based drug elution platform here. You have um, uh, also uh, uh, different methods of getting the, the uh, sirolimus into the wall, but it's more challenging. Um, and this is another I mentioned concept medical, which is a startup out of India, fairly sophisticated. They've done lots of studies. You can see the BTK studies they have planned. Um, and what they use is a phospholipid drug carrier to bring um, to bring the uh, pack or to bring the sirolimus into the wall. 
And this is Sermotics. Uh, again, it's a Minneapolis-based company. They have a product called Sundance. They've done a first in human in a few centers. And this was presented, this showed a pretty significant improvement in patency at, at six months. Uh, and But yet we still would need a pivotal trial before it could be used in the US. And these two, Medtronic and Echotech already mentioned. And you already know this, that, uh, that drug coated balloons have uh, are experiencing new life, if you will, in the in the coronary space as people look for non stent based solutions for a variety of reasons, whether it's small arteries or branch points or or whether it's, um, you know, the pendulum may swing away from stents. It's kind of hard to see how that's going to happen in the coronary space in a dramatic way, just given the 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 uh, success, the uh, unparalleled success of the uh, of uh, drug eluding stent algorithms in the coronary, but nevertheless, um, and when you look at all these, you know, some of these are paclitaxel, some of these are sirolimus, and these are some of the randomized trials that have been done. It's actually pretty far ahead of the BTK space, but I think that some of that technology that's developed for the coronaries may find its way to the BTK space, or perhaps give the companies more confidence. There is a, a bioabsorbable vascular scaffold. So this started out as a device called Esprit, which was uh, look, evaluated in the coronaries. It didn't perform as well as drug eluting coronary stent by an absolute percentage point of, of one or two. It, it was, a, a, in my opinion, not, not a big absolute difference, but percentage wise, a pretty big difference. Nevertheless, this has been repurposed now for the BTK space. This is the <clears throat> Life BTK trial two to one bioabsorbable vascular scaffold versus PTA, relatively short lesions. Uh, it'll be a five-year follow-up. This trial's enrolled, so we'll know the, the results this year. Um, this is some pre-work that went into it. A colleague of mine, Ramon Varco, another guy, Stephen Coombe, from, one from Australia, one from Singapore, um, looked at, at these, used the coronary device in the BTK space and found an excellent patency out to four and five years. So. This gave great encouragement. Um, there are two other bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds in study, uh, both using uh, sirolimus. Uh, one's called R3 vascular, another called Riva vascular. Uh, Riva vascular just started a pivotal trial, um, so that's pretty exciting. And R3 vascular is in the midst of, of fundraising. Also, we're uh, experimenting now with below the ankle angioplasty. And um, this now has gained quite a bit of steam. We have the technology and techniques to do it. Additional uh, technologies being developed. Now studies are starting to come out. The one on the left from Turkey, the one on the right from Japan. The rendezvous registry from Tad Nakama was, is, is probably the largest series in the world. And you can see where the rate of wound healing improved substantially when pedal angioplasty was added to tibial angioplasty. The story is not out yet with the uh, with uh, angioplasty in the foot because we don't have any real patency data beyond acute results. So this, of course, would be necessary. We we need to make sure we're not, you know, <clears throat> injuring our targets. Another important project <clears throat> that that I've been fortunate to be involved with is deep venous arterialization. So. This is now patient, taking patients with uh, what we call desert foot, which is, you know, with essentially no outflow targets, either for endo or open bypass in the foot, and rechanneling the blood supply into the venous system. And uh, this, yeah, it's a, it, it sounds relatively complex, but actually the mechanics of the procedure are fairly straightforward, getting venous access, arterial access, crossing over. Um, it's understanding really the hemodynamics that's been challenging. You know, if it's too brisk, you have a steel. If it's not brisk enough, the, the arteriovenous uh, fistula does not stay open. Uh, we're learning how to drive blood into the forefoot, which collaterals need to be. When I say collaterals, these are essentially venous tributaries that immediately are going to carry flow back to the heart. So th this is one of my patients uh, that was in the... Um, the early feasibility study. This was when I was in Hawaii, so this is already now uh, five years ago. But this is a janitor still working on Maui, 
who had a wound that should never have healed, and he would have ended up with a below knee amputation. He ended up keeping his leg using deep venous arterialization. Again, he was in the early feasibility study. Now we're in the late stages, and uh, it's likely that uh, deep venous arterialization will be uh, FDA approved this year. There's also the potential to have um, to have sensors, to have you know this concept of wearables and implants. I mean, this is part of the coronary world already in the sense that you can monitor uh, for arrhythmias, et cetera. <laughs> But um, there are different efforts to add a sensor to a stent so that we don't have to have this rigorous protocol for uh, surveillance of every stent and every angioplasty we do. Uh, it's going to be a while. I think the regulatory path for that's going to be challenging, but um, that's on the horizon. Also, the idea of using wearables so that we really understand our patient-centered outcomes a little bit better. And this idea of using a wearable to identify um, who's really frail and who's really immobilized and to understand what that means in terms of various implications. Uh, what about robots? Well, this has been a kind of a fits and starts. Uh, I know there's some um, Corindus robots uh, gathering dust in various institutions. And where we go with robotics is a little bit hard to tell. But, you know, if you think about my, uh, my iPhone's got like a billion transistors in it and yet I'm still guiding my wires and my catheters using essentially, you know, 1950s technology using 2D fluoroscopy. Uh, it's better fluoroscopy than it was, but using 2D fluoroscopy in random plastic catheters and trying to put them in places. And yet I get on the highway, I put in my GPS, I, I would never go anywhere without it. So eventually we'll have that. Eventually we'll have all of our catheters, we'll have sensors, and we'll have ways of advancing them without uh, fluoroscopy and understand better where our target site is for delivery, et cetera. Um, I am working with a company out of out of Lithuania, of all places, that's got a really intriguing uh, robot that they've done already now, some studies for a neurovascular intervention. They just did a, a case from 100 kilometers away and did a, did a, uh, a stroke intervention. <laughs> And they're they're heavily into uh, the ability to do do uh, 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 endovascular intervention in the coronary and the neuro space and in the in the vascular space using using uh, robots. So um, yeah, so th this is this will be a longer time horizon, but I, I see this as inevitable. It's really just a question of when. Um, and then lastly, for so many years, we've heard about the human genome and how this was going to revolutionize everything. On the lower left, you can see the cost of, of gene sequencing has dropped dramatically. Uh, but what's happened is through a variety of programs, uh, including the Million Veteran Program and others, uh, these gene sequences have be, be, been, been uh, really uh, identified. And you can see in the upper right this uh, that there is quite a bit of overlap between coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, and large artery stroke. But there's also some that are idiosyncratic to the disease. And I think eventually we'll have treatments that are at not, not just uh, mechanical treatments, but specific interventions that are uh, based on medication for how to make our, our procedures work longer and better for the patients and how to keep them in better shape for longer using targeted therapies to the individual. That's again, a number of years off, but, but I'm feeling optimistic that once everything is sequenced, that people will begin to really tinker with, you know, finding subgroups that can be uh, aided by uh, all these different things. So nevertheless, uh, so I'd say in conclusion, we're, we've got new methods of assessment, um, uh, wound evaluation particularly, but eventually we'll be able to quantify perfusion. We've got new methods of reconstruction, including different kinds of angioplasty. We're working on improving drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents. We do have focal dissection repair, biosorbable vascular scaffold, again, waiting for trial results on the very first one. Uh, we're now going into the foot on a regular basis. We've got deep venous arterialization now, which is on the cusp of being approved. Wearables and implantables, we're just now trying to figure out how that plays a role, but I think it will. 
and then eventually genomic. So um, I hope I didn't go longer than you intended, yeah. but but there's the uh, there's the run, there's the gambit. That's what I was was hoping to talk about. Peter, yeah, that's phenomenal. I, I'm just delighted to see all this innovation and so much happening in the in the peripheral space. I'm I'm also delighted about limb flow. Dan Rose is a good friend. We try to yeah. commercialize a valve in Europe together. Uh, Super. We worked very close together for many years. So I'm so glad he, that his company is being so successful. And it's thanks to people like you. Yeah, I, I didn't know you knew him, but I agree. He's awesome. And yeah. uh, if you ever want to get a good story sometime, ask him about maybe you already have his how he got to be a citizen of Switzerland. <laughs> oh, no, I lived through that. <laughs> when, he was, when he was doing his interviews, me and him were working together and traveling. I was proctoring around Germany and France and um, and in Switzerland. And so we had a lot of stories. Great guy. But I, I mean, I think it's such a novel concept, uh, deep being a such a realization. So yeah. it's great that it's yeah it's coming to fruition. I'm going to pass on to Asma, who's our expert. I may have a couple. I may have a couple of comments I want to make about drug coated balloons later. Go ahead, Asma. Uh, thank you, Azim. Uh, that was a very very excellent talk, Dr. Schneider. Very comprehensive. Lot of data to to chew on. I, I do have a question out of intellectual curiosity. If if there's um, sort of um, equivocal data about below the knee be, below the knee drug coated uh, technology and kind of uh, you know safety um, concerns. Why is that? Why why is there so much money being put into R and D, and why are so many companies still sort of believing in that technology? Is it just our optimism or a lack of other options? Um, that was my first question. I like that first, and then I'll, no. I'll yeah question about that. But yeah, well, that I think I think um, there's tremendous interest in the BTK space because of this uh, rapid rise in CLTI patients. Um, you saw the curves that I showed at, at the beginning of what the uh, growth of diabetes and the growth of, of ESRD look like. So this is, you know, typically, you know, 10 years ago, the, um, the market for FEMPOP disease and the market for BTK disease were like 10 to one, literally, because, you know, most patients got bypasses. Many patients couldn't be, you know, their lesions couldn't be crossed. Now it's more like three to one. So it's a this is rise in 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 the market in the in the size of the addressable market for BTK. So that's one thing. The second thing is that um, you know, whereas I think that the at some point the government, our government, our employer, basically is gonna get very stingy with procedures for claudication. I don't think they can with procedures for limb salvage. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the, the interest in the, the, of CMS to pay for lifestyle related procedures may well become less and less, but for limb saving procedures will continue. So I think part of it's a bet on the future that the market will grow that um, that will have unfettered uh, access to it through reimbursement. And then lastly, um, I think some, some of this investment is based on the fact that we've had success with these mm -hmm. technologies in other areas. I mean, the, imagine the coronary world without drug eluding stents. We've gotten so used to 99% patency <laughs> mm -hmm. at one year, you know, in when it's done in a arteries that are indicated for for treatment, it's just amazing, and um, and yet in the BTK space, we it's like it's almost like a code we haven't been able to crack or a Rubik's mm -hmm. cube that you can't quite you know get it you know set up properly. So I don't know what's going to happen. It's extremely disappointing, and every time you have a negative trial, mm -hmm. it really diverts millions and millions of dollars to something else. I mean, if you were private equity or you were venture capital. And you had your choice between electronic medical record, home dialysis, or BTK drug elution. That third one is the yeah. highest risk for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think that slows progress. Honestly, it does slow progress. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. the the TAC device got uh, the TAC device got FDA approved in 2020. This is the 
I mean, it, it, it's, it's the first uh, uh, implantable approved for below the knee. It's shocking, 2020. Um, mm -hmm. We've had approved implants for every other vascular bed for you know decades, at, at mm -hmm. least a couple decades in the vascular world. So mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. um, okay. so we have a long way to go, but I, I feel like we're I feel like we're making some pretty good progress. Excellent. So is is best CLI um, is that making us nervous in any way, or it's just that you know we always knew like if they were good grafts they were you know good native venous grafts they are always better than anything else is yeah. this something always new or well, is this I mean, something that should discourage you know, yeah my take on the best cli i mean i don't think we should be discouraged at all i mean there's mm -hmm. so much to do um probably the you know one of the most important findings is sort of given a little bit of short shrift and that is that the patients were not necessarily well managed medically mm -hmm. Um, the mortality rate was quite high. The number, you know, not everybody got statins and dual antiplatelets. We definitely got our work cut out for us there. Mm -hmm. But in, in terms of uh, endo versus open, I mean, it's almost the wrong question. I mean, they're kind mm -hmm. of like complementary. They're mm -hmm. still going to be open. It's kind of like carotids in that sense. Coronaries, you know, coronary bypass not going to go away. It just, mm -hmm. uh, there are patients, this idea that we would, you know, we, we had this idea, or at least the idea has been circulating for at least 10 years that eventually every single patient would be treated with open, uh, with mm -hmm. endo. And this okay. is essentially just saying that that's, that's not true. But if you look at the best, I think we screened, I think we put about 20 patients in that trial. And I think we screened 15 to get one into the trial. Um, so, and, and if you look at the best population, they're younger, they're mm -hmm. healthier, they're uh, more likely to be Caucasian, mm -hmm. and um, they're less likely to have chronic kidney disease. So in your young, white, healthy, non-CKD patients with, uh, with BTK disease, there might be a role, you know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. this is not, I, it doesn't, sick. so I think my message is it doesn't apply to everybody. That, that they that's should. That's of our Bronx patients. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think, but, but I do think it really emphasizes this team concept, mm -hmm. you know, that there probably are patients that are going to be better served with just going ahead and getting a bypass rather than getting some crazy, mm -hmm. complex, you know, uh, endo thing that only lasts a couple months and then it has to be redone again and again. Um, there probably are some that uh, if it's super complex, get the vascular surgeon opinion early, check to see, do they have a saphenous mm -hmm. vein? Because that was a big difference mm -hmm. too. Get a single mm -hmm. segment saphenous. Um, that that right. was also uh, helpful. So, okay. Okay. And, okay. And, and also there's more to unpack. You know, we, we need to understand who those patients were. Um, mm -hmm. So there's more to come. You know, they're going to, they'll eventually release, you know, all the disease morphology and everything. So for example, mm -hmm. when we were entering those patients, if mm -hmm. I saw a patient that could be treated with fairly straightforward endovascular, they wouldn't mm -hmm. have, you know, in my opinion, that's not clinical equipoise. Like I'm not going to do a bypass mm -hmm. on somebody with a fairly straightforward endo option. And, um, and I, so I think these were the, you know, these were sort of probably more severe disease morphology for endo mm -hmm. um, that were kind of, so it's sele some selection bias, like in every randomized trial. Mm -hmm. so. I see. I see. No, that makes mm -hmm. sense. sense. Yeah. I do have a question from the chat that I'm going to um, ask. So Garley is one of our fellows and he is asking um, actually a few questions. So he's asking, what are the reasons uh, behind, in your opinion, why Paclitaxel is successful in the FEMPOP space while oh. it's failed the below the knee space one? And then why do the uh, why does Limus uh, fail as compared to um, uh, Paclitaxel in the FEMPOP and uh, while it's very successful in the coronary space? And then I think the uh, third question you already uh, referred to, but but I'll let you first answer those two. Thank you. Yeah, so um, it, it's it's a couple things. Um, well, one one thing about Paclitaxel, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody has really the for sure answer to why it's failed below the knee. I think, you know, as I, as I mentioned, it is a substance that is readily delivered by balloon. A brief mm -hmm. balloon inflation 
It's so hydrophilic, it's taken up into the cells very rapidly. Um, it's something that when I first heard that, you know, the, the first publication on that was a 2007 New England Journal Thunder Trial. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe it. I, I said, no, no way. There's no possible way you could blow up a balloon for a couple of minutes and that that's going to have an effect five years later. Uh, but actually, it, it's been repeated over and over. And I think it's it's readily absorbed into the vessel wall and um, and it's been relatively successful. Lemus is cytostatic rather than cytotoxic. This is why it's a better substance for coronary stents because I mean, you got you got negative almost uh, or may, maybe I would say too much positive remodeling with paclitaxel eluding stents in the coronaries where it did it did so it worked so well to inhibit growth around the stent it actually created a situation where the stents were malopposed because mm -hmm. it created spaces around the stent and this is i think you know partly why paclitaxel was abandoned for coronary stent use um but you know the the every time that lemus has worked well it's been with a stent delivery not mm -hmm. with balloon delivery it's not okay. easy to deliver by balloon and this is where in answer to the question from your your fellow um this is where uh these particular startups that i showed you the mm -hmm. um the company uh out of switzerland med alliance and the one out of india concept medical mm -hmm. it, their deal is that they've developed these proprietary you know nano encapsulation or encapsulation with phospholipid mm -hmm. other carriers to get the drug into the wall we'll see if it works um mm -hmm. The, and so back to why hasn't paclitaxel worked below the knee? Part of it may be the paclitaxel. It may be too toxic for small arteries. Um, mm -hmm. But I think also part of it is that this patient population is so uh, multifactorial. You know, you could do everything perfectly, as you know, and lose the leg from infection that had mm -hmm. nothing to do with the treatment that you yeah. offer or the fact that you improve the blood supply. So, so half of the paclitaxel BTK story is that these trials are really hard to design. And mm -hmm. the other half is probably paclitaxel itself. Nobody's really found kind of the right formula. It may be a lower dose uh, below the knee. And, um, you know, Azim and I are, you know, we, we're helping a company that's experimenting with different concoctions mm -hmm. of diminishing doses of paclitaxel and trying to use that mm -hmm. Uh, in small arteries. So, um, so it's a good question, but if I knew the answers, I would just quit now because <laughs> everybody would invest in, in what I want, you know? So Peter, you know, I'd add to that, you know, the coronary experience on that we've had and that I've seen so far, there are three Lemus coated balloons that have been used in coronary so far. You mentioned solution, magic touch, and there's a Chinese one. And we started to see the first randomized data and what's interesting is all they show is non-inferiority, okay? No superiority. But if you look at the angiographic follow-up data, you, with Paclitaxel, you see exactly what we were hoping, which is positive remodeling and negative leg loss. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't see that with a lemus coated balloon. So I wonder, I, you know, Paclitaxel, as far as a, a coated balloon, I don't think that's going away. Uh, because if you're not mm -hmm. putting it in a stent formulation, we actually want some of that negative, that positive remodeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. There was one right. question I had about you, I had for the BTK and that I wondered about when initially all these bad outcomes came out was we saw this a little bit in coronaries when we started doing diffuse disease and I would put three 30 millimeter balloons into an LED, I would see some slow flow and no reflow, right? And we know, and the FDA has been very adamant about data on particular embolization destiny. So I've wondered when you put a 200 millimeter balloon that is quoted with paclitaxel, and we know that there's no way of quoting it with paclitaxel so that it only is delivered to the wall. There is going to be wash off distally as well. Do you think that some of the bad outcomes could be particular embolization? Yeah, that's a good question. It could be. It could be. I mean, there there have been a couple of... Uh, it's just on the level of case reports at this point, but there've been a couple of case reports where someone went and got the amputation specimen and searched it for, you know, paclitaxel crystals and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, 
So, so there's so there's at least a potential mechanism there that needs to be um, investigated. I mean, people are worried about it, but we've got very you know the evidence for it is more conceptual. You know, it's kind of case report. But um, this idea about the um, w- whenever you see that slow flow, though, to me that's that's particulate. That's just like somebody put too much and forgot to run the, run the garbage disposal. So now the sink won't drain. Um, and, and, and if you think about these diseased feet that we're dealing with that have this incredible, they have medial artery calcification right down to the big toenail. Um, they, 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 their filtering capacity. It's kind of like when we did carotid stents on people in their sixties and seventies, they worked okay. But when we did them on octogenarians, they didn't work okay. The filtering capacity uh, is severely diminished. I think the diabetic foot is also like that. So, you know, you may be onto something. And I think ultimately Pacotaxel in the FEMPOP segment has, has established a very high bar for success. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you. What I've seen with Pacotaxel, you can see where the balloon was. Exactly. With Lima's based mm-hmm. compounds, you can't, mm-hmm. and or at least it's. So I wonder, like you know, Cordis putting, you know, hundreds of millions Absolutely. of dollars into you know, and I I know Med Alliance, I know the guys, I know Jeff Jump. Yeah. He's got he's brilliant. He's his engineers are brilliant. Uh, they have a robust coronary program on the horizon. Uh, maybe they'll be successful, but I wish that I could just look at something and say, aha this definitely works. And I don't have that. I don't have that feeling, you know, they have so much data out there, but it's all like, oh, yeah, this was our success. This looks pretty good. And it, it's a lot of single arm data. Mm-hmm. Also, very it's little hard. To, data. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I think for, you know, I'm a big believer that we're going to find technology that's going to make these patients lives better. But there are a lot of naysayers out there. And mm-hmm. If, if I were if I were one of those people that were were really stuck on the way I've way I've always done it, I would look at the serolimus data and be very unimpressed. At least at mm-hmm. this point. At this point, I mm-hmm. agree. Mm-hmm. I, I have the same um, question. Go ahead, Asma. Sorry. No, no, I just had one more question before uh, before I know we have all to get about that day, and I don't want to keep Dr. Schneider. But mm-hmm. uh, between the three uh, three technologies, TAC, DES, and bio, bioabsorbable scaffold. How do you personally rate them for below this uh, knee space? I mean, obviously you have had a big hand in the inception of TAC, but apart from that, how do you see all of those evolve in the next few years? Yeah, I, well, I think that, you know, drug eluding uh, balloon expandable stents did not work mm-hmm. in the FEMPOP mm-hmm. segment. They didn't. And part of it is the mechanics. I mean, these are highly mobile arteries, you know, even when the patient's in bed at night, they're all twisted up in a pretzel. Um, the, the arteries are moving constantly and yet the stent can't move with it. So, um, I'm sure the, you know, we've done, we've got a lot of data on the FEMPOP segment, uh, on the different forces, twisting, compression, torsion, mm-hmm. stretching, etc. The BTK arteries are exactly the same. All, all you got, got to do mm-hmm. is plantar flex and dorsiflex your you're at your ankle and bend at your knee and imagine what must be happening, you know, as your arteries kind of bunch up in one place or twist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think the future of balloon expandable prostheses below the knee uh, is not very good, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I think also, I think one of the reasons why, I think one of the reasons why the Saval trial failed um, is the Saval, you're probably familiar with it. The, mm-hmm. It was a Boston Scientific. It was a balloon expand. It was basically a, a small caliber eluvia stent mm-hmm. based in the tibials. My personal opinion is that it was too much metal, um, mm-hmm. that the metal was so, the metal burden was so much that it overwhelmed the benefits of the paclitaxel because they only had uh, a 3.5 millimeter diameter stent. Mm-hmm. So imagine a 3.5 millimeter diameter self-expanding stent in a two millimeter or two and a half millimeter artery. So it's like gross oversizing. Mm -hmm. And they also, uh, they they also had uh, lengths up to 14 centimeters. And, you know, the full metal jacket doesn't work great in the SFA. Mm -hmm. And they basically just showed it doesn't work great in the below the knee. 
-hmm. And so, so this is why this concept, I think of like, I don't think we should have any implants below the knee. Mm -hmm. The whole point of TAC is that you don't want to leave a flow obstructing piece mm -hmm. of tissue just hanging into the lumen, you know, mm -hmm. long, slow flow, diffusely diseased arteries. Think of Passau's law, um, where mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the flow is proportional to the radius to the fourth power. And now right. say you take away half that radius with a dissection. Mm -hmm. And everybody mm -hmm. looks at those dissections and says, oh, we can just leave those. They're, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You go, what? Like, we don't leave them anywhere else in the body Why? because mm -hmm. they, they inhibit, you know, so, and you think of the flow rates in the tibials are already terribly, terribly slow flow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not that unusual to have a 15 centimeters a second or 10 centimeters a second of, uh, of flow velocity. So, um, you know, so you put a couple of obstructions in there. So anyways, getting back to your question, I individualize, I mean, in the proximal tibials, um, if I have a really uh, nasty dissection, I might uh, put a coronary drug eluting stent. Tax work great there as well. Um, tax also work in a place where you don't want to put a drug eluting stent in the middle and distal portion where the exposure to external forces, you know, just getting hit by a car door. Um, mm -hmm. I had a drug eluding stent as a uh, uh, as the inflow to a fairly complex reconstruction, and somebody just put a blood pressure cuff and did an ABI without without checking and crushed the stent. So, oh, wow. yeah, I mean, it's you know, there, once you put them in, the patient, you know, this is bit my bad. You know, I should have had a bracelet on them. I, you know, when you put a drug eluding coronary stent below the knee, there, you know, it can be crushed. I mean, it's not like the coronaries where, you know, you've got a potential space around the heart mm -hmm. and protection right. from, the, mm -hmm. from the sternum. So anyway. All right. All right great. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah nice. Uh, nice to talk. And, uh, very and nice to talk. thanks for all the questions. Peter, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's early for you. And yeah, you bet. We're very appreciative. Uh, we've all learned so much. And thank you for your partnership and friendship. I'll talk to you soon. Pleasure. Sounds good. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.